In an emergency situation, be it fire, flood or anything else, the public focus is usually on the person in the front line. The drama, the devastation, the anguish of those affected is played out, however briefly, on our television screens and newspapers. But what of those behind the front line? For every person working here, there are numerous people behind the scenes, all working with the aim of resolving the emergency. Everyone from the front line back has an important role to play. How these people work together and the structure under which they operate has a direct impact on the effectiveness of dealing with the emergency. In the department, there is a common structure that applies in most emergencies. The Australian Inter-Service Incident Management System, Incident Control System, or AIMS ICS. This video outlines the Incident Control System, using the 2003 bushfires as the backdrop. Such a large-scale event that all elements of the structure were brought into play. Multiple fronts, interagency and even international cooperation. This is the structure on paper. The key sections are the incident controller, distinguished by the colour white, and working under its direction, planning section, distinguished by yellow, operations section, distinguished by red, and logistics section, distinguished by blue. The incident controller may perform all of these functions. As the incident grows and the management functions become more demanding, the functions of operations, planning and logistics are delegated. Each section is made up of a variety of units to support its function. The planning section includes resources, situation analysis, situation reporting from ground and air observers, management support and information, as well as technical specialists. Under operations, division and sector commanders look after specific areas within the overall event and then closer to the front line, the task force and strike team leaders and their crews. The other part of operations includes air operations, with air attack supervisor and aircraft officer looking after fire bombers and air bases respectively. The old saying is that an army marches on its stomach, which is where logistics comes in. Responsibility for providing all those things that are needed to support people in the field comes under this section. Catering, supply of clothes and other day-to-day -day requirements, ensuring facilities and ground support are available, as well as communications, medical support and finance. All these units have a focus on supporting these people. The crews on the front line, whether in the air or on the ground. Our first objective today is probably to get Charlie going on to pushing this track through here. We've got another dozer working, uh, Bernie Flanagan, and he's been coming in from the other side down an old coop um, track. On paper, the incident control system is a vertical hierarchy. This ensures that everyone adheres to his or her role, and each person doing their job is the best way to ensure that the support for the frontline crew is maintained. While each unit reports vertically, both up and down, the coordination across each of these three main areas of logistics, planning and operations is vital. The four key positions of incident controller, planning officer, logistics officer and operations officer constitutes the incident management team or IMT. Each of these areas works towards the common goal of supporting the operations crew. Our department puts fires out by scratching a track around them, basically. And whether that's done with a bulldozer or a rake hoe, the fire's not out until it's tracked. Everything else we do is a support service. In the case of aircraft, it's about protecting and providing support to ground troops. It's about delaying fire behaviour until those tactics can be put in place. So how does it work on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour basis? It's a circle of information and everyone plays a part. It's important that those in the field 
and at the fire front can provide detailed information about the fire behaviour in small and large areas, really localised weather conditions in isolated spots and information about the terrain. It's only when all the items of local knowledge are tied in with the big picture issues that good decision making can occur, which is why it is important that information from the field crew is fed back to the incident management team. It's very, it's very quiet around here, yeah. and I think leave it alone. Uh, well, it's only going to north. If it's the north, they're not going to damage it anyway. And even if it's from the south, they're going to burn back into what's already there. My belief to try and take that out, you run the risk you, you may get a spot up into here. We don't want that, so I'm, <laughs> no. leave it alone. <laughs> leave yes. it alone is yeah. the best advice. Okay, here. cool. This is combined with a variety of other information about the emergency accumulated from many sources. This can be from the planning section, the operations section, the logistics people and from outside sources such as the Bureau of Meteorology. The incident management team considers the information and decides what is needed for the next phase of the emergency, whether it's the next hour, the next shift, the next day. The decisions made at this level are implemented by each of the sections. While logistics ensures that day-to-day -day support services are in place and operations puts in the hard yards at the front line, the planning group, as its name indicates, maps out the plan of attack. Basically the operations officer's role, you work with uh, the planning, logistics and resources in the incident management team to, to supply all the resources to fight the fire then operations actually plans where those resources go to fight the fire on the ground and they'll also work with the aircraft unit if there's any air support needed for transport of crews, bombing aircraft or um, air rec reconnaissance of the fires. Ground support provides the infrastructure to move things around. Uh, for example, make sure that um, we've got enough vehicles to carry out the tasks if we've got to deliver fire, uh, meals to the fire line. Yep. Ground support provides the vehicles to do that sort of work. Um, just to pick up supplies from the from all the suppliers to see our supply unit might order the goods. Ground support supplies the vehicles and people to go and pick them up. Generally, within the planning unit, there, there's two broad functions. Um, the the primary function of the planning unit during their shift is the delivery of the incident action plan, of commonly referred to as the IAP. Um, basically, the IAP sets out the directions for the tasking and the work plans for the next shift coming on. So the night shift planning team will develop that package ready for an 0700 changeover for the day shift. What is required in terms of people and other resources is then passed back to each group through briefings, emails, telephone calls and by radio. The incident controller is the person in the hot seat who makes the call on what's needed and where. Well, first, the incident controller role is the manage, manager's role. It's a, it's a mixture of management, day-to-day -day management, or hour, in real crisis, hour by hour. But it's also the leadership role, which is you know pointing the direction, keeping the calm when need to keep the calm, which often happens, and just keeping the show on the road. But it is a real true management role over a long period, extended period, 12 or 14 hours.